I'm Philip Mortlock, and I'm a good friend of those lovely boys in excess, and I'm here with you on Access All Areas. Well, hello, and welcome to an Access Access All Areas. My name is Bee, and I will be co-hosting this series of podcasts with my in excess nerd, Hayden Murdoch. We will be delving deep with you all to explore everything there is to know about this iconic band of brothers in excess, sharing music, tours, videos, albums, and oh, so much more. Well, hello, welcome to Excess Access All Areas, episode 68, where we dive deep into the awesomeness of this band in excess, uh, bring them towards the Hall of Fame along with our community, and just have a good old gas bag every week or so, or so be. Uh, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I am good. You haven't good. heard the word gas bag for a while, have gas you? Gas bag is very English, that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, something my mother taught me when I grew up, having a good old chin wag or a chin gas wag, bag. Chin yes, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no, I'm, very, I'm very excited. We've, had, we've been talking all day, I feel. It's well, been quite an pre- exciting day, hasn't it? We've done a bit of pre-production work and stuff like oh. that. So uh, if this sounds uh, even less professional uh, than normal, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, hope that that may be in vain. But um, as always, has your in excess week been, B? I know it was a bu- busy editing weekend last week. You got a bit stressed last week in editing, didn't you? I did. You, you gave me some really kind words. Thank you for that. I was like about to smash my computer up. I Didn't you admit. ask for the kind words? <laughs> Please <laughs> say something is. nice to me. I, I think you did. Yeah. yeah. Kudos. <laughs> and you did. You did. You come back. Yeah. Two hours of editing after it had gone out. So yeah, let's not go there. Anyway. That's okay. That's so, okay. But how's your week been anyway? You've well, always the weekend, working on something. Yeah, the week. Well, Mana, the weekend was good because we live streamed with Nick Egan, which is really nice, really good. So I think there was about ten of us in total yeah. of the from the patrons. Got a couple of new ones come out um, straight away, which was really good. And I presented Nick with the awards for silver and gold. I'm just in the process of making it into a movie, so I'll pop it out. You're going to love it, Hayden. Wow. It's Star Wars esque. You're going to love it. So you've you've got a bit of George Martin pr- producer in you. Now you've got a bit of uh, George Lucas movie maker in you. Okay? Yeah. I'm going to call you George. George. Yeah. <laughs> George. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. Um, but only yesterday I was doing because of covid you have to do a lot of these zoom meeting things now don't you and because of Mm. dad's health i was talking to this guy called david i don't know how i got my podcast talked about but i did and he said oh he says i used to work in sydney for a pest control company he says and i I saw the a famous name written down and uh, he was at andrew ferris's house doing pest control but andrew never let on um he was trying to hint you know oh i like in excess music but he wasn't having a bar of it so i thought that was quite funny <laughs> so hi to david he wasn't trying to show off a, a uh, an ambitious kirk uh, in Media Wars, uh, sneaking th- into the house, was he at all? I thought he was Kirk. He said he was around about 2006 and it right. was on Pit Water Road. But, I mean, I suppose they have quite a few houses everywhere, don't they? Yes, probably. Mm, probably. All right. Now, just to recap a little bit, obviously, as you said, you did your little midweek uh, get-together with the patrons. Um, just a little sort of reiterator. Uh, I know we'll welcome a patron soon, but never has the patron program had more services, more access, more information, more sort of uh, inner content that only goes out to a select few than now. Uh, so if you are considering uh, maybe foregoing a cup of coffee or tea per week, um, and want to put something into our podcast, uh, see this as a little bit of an advertorial, but I can only just sort of sit back and go, wow, um, if I was a patron and I was an NXS fan, the access that, you know, you've put in behind the scenes with some of the uh, the programs be uh, uh, are fantastic. So well, kudos to you and, um, you know, jump on board if you want to come for the ride because we're all going to America. We're all going to be there on the day of the Rock Hall of Fame. You want to be in it to win it. So uh, uh, I'll uh, say well done to you on that regard, B. I have to say, every single one of the patrons are so adorable and lovely. Such kind, kind people. And mm. um, we have the um, have the most fun, don't we, on the chat? So well, I noticed yeah. that you're chatting a little bit more now, which is fun. They love that. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a little chat room going on, and we've got our yes. own page. It's very special, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And look, you know, I, I started throwing in Stevie Nicks live in concert the other day, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to throw a few things out there. And, oh, uh, actually, hey, it's a 
run, I've what? got you. <laughs> What's this about trying to get Susan Lynn to clean your house? Went over well, my head no, a bit, she, that she one. couldn't jump onto the Nick Egan thing um, <laughs> and she had to said she had to clean her mum's house. I thought, well, oh, remember I that? Didn't see that she, that's what she had said, yeah, so thinking, she couldn't jump on. I think you were, Hayden. I no, mean, it was an in excess joke on trying the- to get the patrons to clean your house. No. <laughs> She's in LA as if, but uh, it was an in-joke on the back of her not being able to jump onto the Nick Eager thing. So that was all. So uh, tongue-in-cheek. Oh, but, but she's a hero, hey, after last yeah. week. That was brilliant. Well, Snogging we did, did, Michael Hutchins at 16. Well, we did come <laughs> off our Zoom call, let the people speak, be sort of subtly and sneakily rebranded as Gil Chat. But uh, it, was, it was great. You know, like it really flowed nicely. And I think uh, some of the feedback from those who, who listened in really enjoyed it because – you know, the anecdotes that the, the, the lovely lady shared about, you know, even meeting Michael and I think uh, one of them smooching him incessantly <laughs> through to uh, a bit of Belinda cuddle action on the uh, on the ground. Oh, that, uh, yeah, that was yeah. good, wasn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, these are stories that, that need to live and need to be heard. And, mm. um, and, and, and even if it's just you in your bedroom in 1986 with a song that meant something to you, I mean, mm. that's the forum of the Zoom calls is to, you know, you express your feelings and uh, amidst a, a community of like-minded people. So uh, a big heartfelt thank you for, for the ladies uh, for their efforts last week. Actually, I've had a few people on Instagram say, I want to be, I wanted to be on that chat. And I said, well, become a patron. You can come on the next one. Well, so look, we have, it was our first Zoom call for about 20, 25 episodes and, really? and we did was wait it? a bit too long. So we mm. will be endeavouring to do more. Uh, we'll do more in North America. But we've got UK. other people hey. knocking on the door, Hayden. How are we going to fit all these episodes in? I can't, I can't keep up now. <laughs> well, I, th- I was going to hit you up, B, on doing a two episode drop a week. How do you feel about that? <laughs> do I get paid? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that. See if Thank we can get you. Some, some royalties. Um, <laughs> just, just a quickie as well. We did have an exit song last week, which was the cover, the Eskimo Joe original Sin one, which is a great sort of acoustic y sort of version. B, did you like that? Oh, I love Eskimo Joe anyway. So, yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then we put that extra song on there, which you really loved as well from yeah. the sea. I don't know if you've heard that before, but yeah. You had heard it before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Such beautiful keyboards and things, isn't it? You know? mm, mm, gorgeous. So we, in excess, we're always a big proponent and, uh, you know, promoter of Australian music. So, you know, if you if you did like the Eskimo Joe cover and then sort of the, the song from the sea there, they've got, look, they've got a Greatest Hits album out, hence, you know, their plethora of great songs here in Australia. They've probably got you know, 15, 20 uh, mainstay songs that get, you know, played here a lot. Um, probably their biggest hit, but you might remember Black Fingernails, Red Wine. Yes. Uh, which was probably their number one hit. Um, I mean, they're just a band that uh, we'd love you to check out as well. So, um, it's a speaking, cute name for a band, isn't it? It is, it is. Uh, and again, Cav is the guy who did sing on sort of uh, To Look At You on the original Sin uh, 2010 11 sort of, uh, you know, uh, release of all the band songs. He gave vocals to that and uh, awesome voice and um, another WA guy as well. So, I think he. Probably has an affinity with the got the the band's Perth origins uh, as well. So, but I'll pause. It's probably time to welcome uh, personally the patrons, and I believe we have two new ones today. B. I'd like to say hello to everybody outside on the highway. Let's all say hello to everybody outside. It's about ten thousand people at least. Hello. Hello to our honorary patrons, Nick Egan, Mark Opitz, Cameron Adams and Mary Woods. Also like to say hello to Sue D, Joe Robbins, Carmen, Laurie, Carrie Ann, Danielle, Sarah Markram, Dr. Jim, Katie, Felicia, Lisa Mack, Anne-Marie, Susan Purvis, Foxy, Lisa Urban, Pedro, Mandy, Lisa Calloway, Matt, Linda, Vern, Paul Boozy, Yvonne, Caroline, Amanda H, Leon, David, Tracy, Paul Jolie, Sandrine, Warren, Sarah Camia, Susan B, Amanda V, Ella, Ryder, Tony, Erica, Abigail, Martin, Stefan, Val, Jim, Matey, Kelly, John, Jackie, Sean, Sheila, Shannon, Virginia, Helen, Brett, Suzanne, Glenn, Laurel, and our latest one, The Ace.
All right. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for both podcast uh, patrons as always. Um, I guess, you know, we did speak a little bit about our little journey, B. Eventually, we're going to head to America and go on a bit of a, a mystery tour or a holiday um, holiday road. Did you like that little song last week, the little ditty from Lindsay Buckingham? <laughs> yeah, it's cute. Holiday road. <laughs> so I've already I've already started calculating the cities, B, and just looking at this. So um, there's certain parts of my life I'd like to be 12 months in advance of, and there's some yeah. parts of my life. Some I live from of, day to day. Some parts of my life. <laughs> Life, I like to be told. It's going to be an interesting journey, us two. <laughs> <laughs> this could be the where the band has irreconcilable differences. Hopefully not. <laughs> but um, uh, today we are very excited to, in our topic, uh, uh, be joined by Philip Mortlock, who was the creator of the Swing album cover and the Listen Like Thieves album cover, but also was heavily involved in you know, some of the singles and the uh, the artwork with those. And the amount of information we're about to go through with Philip B, um, we think to do justice, this might have to be a two-parter because yeah. um, he's, he, he's just got such a plethora of information and I think he's mm. going to be a very giving guest. So, so what's the time for, B? It's time for the news. Hi, it's Dave from England and you're listening to In Excess Access All Areas with Hayden and B and now it's time for the news. All right, B. Well, we love to get into chart news, etc. There, a stabilising week, no sort of up and downs massively Ooh. in this last week for the very best of. It's gone from thirty three to thirty five. Mm-hmm. It's not disastrous, uh, very very stable. But uh, I believe there are Eskimos in the North Pole who don't have a copy. So <laughs> if you do want to get onto the Australian uh, iTunes and order yourself a copy up there in in the North Pole. Well, I did put a post out for Father's Day, so hopefully um, some gift cards might have gone out, and they're buying Correct. their own. Uh, go 100%. buy your. Uh, <laughs> and another good, you know, obviously there was a lot of uh, press in the band's favour in the last month regarding the uh, record, you know, that this album has broken being in the top 100. Well, uh, it did make its way all the way over to American uh, publications called Billboard, which is sort of the, uh, I guess, the chart certification or certification, I should say, Bible of all things relevant to American charts and music. Uh, so there was a really good feature article, uh, I think on August 16th in Billboard about the album and uh, some of the quotes do come from other articles and things, but it's good that America uh, are from afar getting to see what this album is still doing down under. And uh, as I think Philip may sort of uh, share, with, share with us later, you know, the back catalogue and the current sort of catalogue of releases like Seven Deadly Sins and things is such a, an asset value to uh, a band like In Excess. Uh, and all the platforms that they can release it sort of uh, via these days, isn't it, Mm, Yeah, yeah. Um, So look forward to exploring that with Philip. Also, too, uh, John Stevens' gig. uh, We're hoping the October 8th gig in Melbourne is going to come about, which is a month away. You're going to go? Well, if it's there, I'm going to go, yeah. And then we might have to get... A month away. Do you reckon I'll be out of lockdown? Do you reckon I can come? I want to go. (laughs) We might be able to then lock down uh, John for uh, some interview time, so we'll see how we go. Mind lockdown in John. Speaking of touring, uh, over in America, we do like to give every few weeks a bit of a reference. The Kick Experience are playing in Saginaw, Michigan, on uh, or Michigan uh, on October twenty second. Mm-hmm. So they've been sort of touring that northeast northeast region of America, and uh, I think it's pronounced Saginaw from uh, my uh, pop culture memory. But uh, yeah, so they're going to be playing October twenty second, uh, which is which is exciting. So. 
Um, we do know that there are various cover bands and, and uh, people playing in excess music around the globe, some official, some unofficial, but just check your guides because it is a COVID world and different rules for different cities and different countries. Last thing we'll do amidst all the copious, you know, headlines and articles and dodgy lawyers, all we'll continue to keep saying is good luck, Timmy. We're with you. We're thinking of you. Timmy, I the tiger. Keep it up, son. <laughs> yes, we've got you back, mate. Absolutely. Don't let some suit take you down and uh, keep your head up. Yeah. And everybody else as well. I've just had some news come in. I I need to have it confirmed, please, Mr. Hayden. Mm-hmm. I've mm-hmm. just heard that In Excessive, the tribute band, have just retired. Well, that's wow. interesting. It well, is there interesting. Were two, there were two versions of them, I think. Is that there right? There is, yeah. yeah. So we'll have to look into that. And if it is, they were very, very sad about that. And we, we wish you all the best. Yes. Well, we'll get that confirmed uh, mm. or, denied, uh, or denied. And we'll see how we go. <laughs> there could be one In Excessive band left over very happy, though. Perhaps they've mingled together. We shall see. But that's the news of the week, B. Short and sharp today. Cool. Hey, this is Tim Farris. Big shout out to Hayden and B. Also want to say hello to all the listeners and NXS fans. Thanks for listening. I love you, Hayden and B. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Hi, this is Ella from Middleburg, the Netherlands. You're listening to In Excess, Access All Areas with Hayden and B. And now it's time for the topic of the week. access all areas thank you for your time uh, my pleasure good to be here look we were just doing a little bit of ad living before i guess uh, the real record but you did ask a very interesting question about you know the hall of fame pursuit and we were about to say it's been well it is a highly political organization i think um my research on you is that you were a former board member of aria is that right yes i sat on the board of aria for 10 years um, yes which i guess and- for those listeners who don't know i mean that probably has a hall of fame component to it doesn't it Oh, it certainly does. And in fact, in excess of being inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame. Um, so that, that box is ticked. Um, yes. but, the, but the US Hall of Fame or Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which was established, you know, many years ago, um, uh, and, it, and they've, you know, they've got a lot of money poured into this, this, uh, this organisation and it's got, a, it's got a home in Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, and then there's this, you know, this, uh, this annual uh, jockeying for who should be nominated and who should be inducted and all that sort of thing. And everybody's got an opinion on it. And there's obviously a lot of politics that goes on behind the scenes. So one can only imagine, you know, how, how complex... Uh, the process is, but yeah, uh, my feeling is that uh, that you know, of course, like like you thinking that NXS should have been inducted by now, yes, surely, surely. Um, so yes, and I and I suspect that the the people that that we should be lobbying, uh, and I've actually made some inquiries, you know, in the last couple of days, just to sort of you know do my bit. Uh, is, oh, wow. you know, Thank you. Well, well, so it, you know, NXS's catalogue is uh, is with Universal throughout the world. 
and, and they are one of the big players in the in the business, of course. But uh, but in in the states, um, Warner Music, uh, with their label Rhino Records, um, manages the band's uh, catalogue up until I think X or thereabouts. So so basically, um, in excess signed to Atlantic Records in America and and Canada when when we got involved when I was at Warner's back in the, in the the early 80s and so Warner still owns the catalog in the US for most of those major albums that the, that the band released so Warner's could be influential as well it being the American Rock and Roll Hall of Fame so yeah. so I've sent I've sent off a few emails to some people that I know at Warner's and some people that I know at Universal and we'll see I mean I haven't got any 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 news for you at this stage? No, oh, but that's oh, we'll great. It. That is brilliant. That's <laughs> making me smile so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We needed someone like you to help us out with this. Well, the interesting thing, of course, is that, you know, the, the, the great champion for In Excess for many years uh, was Chris Murphy, who was their manager. And, uh, and unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. So uh, it's hard to know whether he had ever... You know, I mean, knowing Chris, I'm sure you know he's a tenacious bastard, and he would have <laughs> worked very hard to uh, to get things like this across the line. In fact, I'm surprised that he didn't. You know, yeah. Um, but maybe he was busy doing other things. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, we always seem to have an agenda, and I think think getting the rights to the catalog back and sort of you know re going from band to brand and all these particular initiatives. I think uh, the musical, you know, mini series, all these things. He always had a project. So you always got the feeling that there was always an agenda. And I think from even him passing, there's a five year post Chris plan in the works. A which plan, as, you would, a plan. <laughs> as you would probably know, he's either up there in heaven or down there in hell. You know, uh, <laughs> having a great time probably with Michael, but uh, I think that, you know, he definitely left a legacy five-year plan, uh, you know, with people like Sam Evans and people behind the scenes, um, you know, post his departure, you know. So maybe maybe that is part of it. You think it would be, you know. So what do you think has got to happen then, Philip? What, what, what do you think the process should be? Well, it's like any any uh, any of these sort of um, political scenarios. You've got to lobby, and uh, and you've got to have the right people lobbying for things. Mm. So, as I say, it's probably best to go straight to the labels who who have the the most influence over that process. Uh, okay, I'm yeah. Yeah. because yeah. because yeah. as being fans, I don't think we've really got a voice. We can we can make noise, which is what we're trying to do, and get more fans together as a community to make that noise. Why aren't we there? And um, we were talking about Dr. Chim has got the petition going, but yeah. I think from a professional and from musician, other musicians, that's where we need the push. And we can't do that unless we can reach out to you guys to help us. Look, you know, the, 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 the sad fact is that, you know, statistics uh, often are the most uh, influential thing that you can have in, in pushing an agenda like this. And the statistics on the success of the band are there for everybody to see, you know, and they continue. I mean, the great thing is that, that uh, like a lot of other so-called heritage artists uh, in in this world uh, that we live in now, um, you know, there's there's more going on with with artists like In Excess and their catalogue than there are with you know new and developing artists. Yeah, um, because they have. I mean, this is the beauty of the streaming world. It has sort of opened up a whole new way for the industry to to manage and and foster the uh, the ongoing interest in in uh, an artist's uh, repertoire you know uh, and and the thing i love about all this is that you know that that in the in excess catalog along with all these other artists that i'm sort of loosely referring to are finding new audiences every day yeah you know? so so we're not just talking about you know a graying old audience that you know used to be fans of in excess and are sort of still hanging on to it yes they're there still but but there's a whole new generation of, of fans that come on board and discover in excess uh, and other bands like them or other artists like them, and that will continue. And I think that's the, the wonderful new sort of brave new world that we're in. Well, I think one of the things, yeah, one of the things which is quite interesting is that by virtue you don't have to really go off and manufacture the music, <laughs> i.e. tapes, CDs, you know, um, eight tracks, all those type vinyl. You don't have to really manufacture the actual music anymore. I mean, the song is there in a sort of a digital sort of platform that can be reignited. 
uh, yeah, look, through yeah. these streaming platforms. It's sad that we don't have a physical product uh, as much uh, dominating the, the scenario as much because, you know, for me in particular, you know, I, I got into this industry because I loved album cover art, yeah. you know. And Which we were, look, I can't wait to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I still think that's relevant, but, but you're right, you know, the streaming has made, well, you know what, the best thing about it is it's made the music more accessible. Mm-hmm. So anybody can access music whenever they want and everything is there, you know, Mm -hmm. practically everything that you ever wanted to listen to, whether you've just found out about something that was recorded and released in 1920 or 2020, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, It's all there. And for the for the meager price of a subscription, uh, you can you can access it, you know, in any which way you want. So so that's great. But but the physical product itself is still attached to what an artist um, values as their art, you know, mm-hmm. so that that's, I mean, and that's not going to go away. Our artists want to make albums because mm-hmm. they are, you know, I've used the, it's a crass analogy, but I've used it many times. It's like a painter doing a whole bunch of paintings and then deciding either by themselves or with the help of a, a curator to then select um, the paintings that, that are good out of what they've done and then put on an exhibition. So the album is the exhibition. And, uh, and if you think about an artist like In Excess, you know, they had cycles where they would make albums, then they would go on tour, then they would make an album, then they would go on tour. And somewhere in amongst all of that, they would write songs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's the interesting thing when you look back at a, a career of, of, a, of a band like In Excess and see, as you've obviously done, you know, forensically looking at, you know, the, each album and, and, you know, what the results were of those albums and how did they manage to do that in amongst everything else that was going on. Yeah. It's well, pretty I'd like to, Yeah. I'd like to give a uh, sort of due acknowledgement to your career, Philip, because I think for our listeners, um, this is also an education, a little bit about the backdrop of how it is you came to work with the band. But I know, uh, and again, loose research, but uh, I think you were at sort of Warners or WA for about 17, 18 years. So around the mid seventies to about 92. Does that sound right to you? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and look, obviously a very vital time, and I guess for some of our listeners, I think you've worked and, and had involved with artists ranging from Cold Chisel, Richard Clapton, Gaudier, Lior, Jenny Morris, Icehouse, Boom Crash Opera, 1927, Mentals, anything. Some I think you work with on your current origin sort of label now, and then some yep. back in the day when you were probably with Warners, I assume. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it's 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 been quite a journey. Yeah. So what, what do you call yourself? <laughs> You've uh, got lots of little hats going on, or big hats, I should say. Well, uh, yeah. No, I don't. I don't have a a, a, a um. Yeah, it, it's hard to say. But look, you know, <laughs> uh, the thing that I've enjoyed uh, through the process um, and and continue to do so right now is that I'm I kind of see myself as the creative middleman. Mm. Um, so you've got commerce and you've got art. And then I'm sort of like the go-between between between the two. So um, that's how I've sort of seen my role, so to speak. It's not, it's not an official sort of, you know, title that I can give myself, but I've always seen the value in what people do creatively. Uh, And then through the the work that I've done, you know, getting jobs in record companies and, and, and then becoming my own, business and, and learning about publishing and licensing and all the other aspects of, of the sort of the administrative side of the business. I think in I've the learned- 70s and 80s, that word, and probably 90s, A&R man uh, seems to uh, either have uh, shivers up the spine of some artists and it also seems to actually be real positive depending on the band well, and the, the A&R guy, I guess, you know. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, I actually avoided uh, I avoided that being title. the a yeah. yeah, because to me, I observed fairly early on that it was a revolving door, and that A and R people come and go. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my my official title for many years at Warner's, certainly when I started working with In Excess, was Creative Services, and I was the Creative Services Manager within the organisation. Um, and it was a it was a blissful scenario for me to be floating around uh, the, the business at the time because we had this uh, this influx of amazing uh, artists and repertoire coming in from the, from yeah. the, the US labels. Um, the UK company was kicking in with a whole lot of fantastic signings like Elvis Costello and the Pretenders and and uh, and many others. So yeah, it was it was I mean it, it, the, the company was was 
was the market leader at the time because of the the amazing influx of international uh, product that we had from Warner Brothers, Electra, and Atlantic and Asylum, the, the main labels that, that uh, Warner's is. Uh, and then locally, we managed to build up a fantastic roster of, uh, of Australian talent. And a lot of the activities that, that sort of happened through that through those years and through that process were sort of opening and closing doors, you know, or the classic sliding door scenario where, mm-hmm. you know, things. So I'm often uh, caught uh, using the phrase "one thing leads to another" in this yeah. business, um, I can usually put it down to how did that happen? Well, because this happened, and then the knock-on effect was this, and then that, and so forth. The thing I like about using the phrase "one thing leads to another" is that my relationship with In Excess started with one thing, literally. <laughs> It didn't quite start with that. So, so we we were very fortunate in that we we had worked with Colchester for for many years. Um, Colchester was signed to Warner's when I was uh, still in the art department there. Um, that was in 1977, and 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 then I was promoted out of the art department to be a PR person. So for for the next couple of years, I did PR. And, and I worked Cold Chisels records, you know, to radio and press and all that sort of thing, and uh, amongst other artists and, and, and many other things going on. But, you know, Cold Chisel to me was like a big, sharp learning curve for me about what it's like to work with an Australian band and go from, you know, standstill position to being one of the biggest acts in the, in, in the market. Mm. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about that, uh, as an aside, is, of course, Cold Chisel, you know, they were huge uh, and still are. Uh, their catalogue is still, you know, highly active in this day and age. But unfortunately, they never broke overseas, you know. So lesson learned, there was one of many great Australian bands that, you know, that, that the tyranny of distance and whatever else you want to put it down to never quite broke outside of Australia. And I had a great relationship with the band's members and, and you know, I worked with them on their, their album covers and their videos and, and their marketing and so forth. So um, Don Walker from the band uh, got asked by an Adelaide filmmaker called Scott Hicks to do the score for his first feature film, which was called Freedom. Mm. And so long story short, uh, we, the Warners, committed to putting the soundtrack album out that Don had recorded. Uh, and he'd recorded the album essentially with the members of Cold Chisel, but not with Jimmy Barnes singing. He got Michael Hutchins to sing a couple of the songs that were in, in the score. I ended up having a meeting as the creative services manager by this stage for Warners with Chris Murphy and Michael Hutchins about uh, the song that Michael sings on the soundtrack called Speed Kills. Uh, yeah. And we were planning to put that out as a single. And Scott Hicks, the filmmaker who had made the, the feature film had shot a video of Michael. I don't know whether you've ever seen it, but yeah, it's yeah. very cool. In the sort of car junkyard. In the junkyard, right? yeah. yeah. So this was the first solo thing that Michael did outside of Phoenix Excess. And, and I had seen In Excess a couple of times as a support act to Cold Chisel. That's how I first saw them. So the Cold Chisel connection was how I, I got to meet these guys. And I'm having a meeting with Michael and Chris talking about releasing the, the, uh, the Speed Kill song as a single to go with the soundtrack. And Chris basically opens up and says he's frustrated with Australian record companies and he's been with this independent label, but they just haven't been able to break the band, you know, outside of Australia and they've done a pretty pretty poor job here in Australia and, and uh, you know, would Warners be interested in, in, in excess? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure from that moment that I met Chris that day that I was being played, you know, but that's because he was a very shrewd businessman. And I think he sort of basically said in his sights that Warners would be a good place considering how well we were doing with Cold Chisel and many other Australian bands for in excess to land. So that's where the conversation started. I introduced him to the managing director of the company at the time, Paul Turner, and the new A&R guy at the time, um, a guy called Gibson Kemp. Now, interestingly, 
Gibson had just replaced Mark Opitz, who was the A and R manager at, at oh, Bourne. Of course, yeah, they just uh, missed, yeah. Well, saying that. just missed. No, basically, Paul Turner, <laughs> my boss uh, at the time, was pissed off with uh, with Mark Opitz for for what he referred to as moonlighting, as in spending all his time in the studio producing and not being in the office being an A and R guy. <laughs> so <laughs> they essentially came to an impasse and said, "Well, you you, you can't do." You can't do both. And Mark said, well, I, I have to be in the studio because I'm in demand and that's what I want to do. So Mark left and then then Warners then hired Gibson to be the new a guy. Gibson was a, a British guy who had moved to Australia a few years before, um, had worked previously with Polygram Records in the US, uh, sorry, in, the U, uh, in Europe. Um, anyway, so he and Chris Murphy... Uh, and Paul Turner then arm wrestled over the deal that they were doing for In Excess to sign with with Warners, and the intention was that that In Excess would sign to Warners in Australia for the world. Um, but Chris, being the shrewd businessman that he is, that he would say, "Well, I need guarantees," and so he was insisting that uh, that Warners guarantee releases in every market in the world, and that they guarantee marketing investment in developing the band uh, across the world. And so then Warners Australia then had to convince its its affiliates around the world uh, and, and also to find one of the US labels that would be interested in, in picking up these commitments. Otherwise, we weren't going to get a world deal. So a long story short is that Warners Australia couldn't guarantee the kind of things that Chris was demanding. So uh, Warners Australia signed in excess uh, to a licensing deal for Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, and Japan. Through the introduction to Atlantic, uh, In Excess did a deal with Atlantic's ATCO label, an offshoot of Atlantic, run by a lady called Reen Nally. Um, so she got it. She she saw the, the value or the, the prospect of In Excess, and so she pushed for Atlantic to sign In Excess for US and Canada. And then uh, by this stage, Gibson... It was still working for Warners, thought, well, if uh, if Warners Europe are st- stupid enough not to look at the opportunity that they have, I'll, I'll tip off my friends at Polygram. And so Polygram ended up doing a separate deal for the rest of the world. So so Chris ended up with a perfect scenario. Perfect, he had, yeah. You had three different major entities um, investing in the band's international development which means he also had three sources of income wow. so when you when you do yeah. a when you do a deal like the ones that he did with the three different companies he's got you know buckets of money coming in to support the the marketing and promotion of of the band's repertoire in each market in, in, well, it's probably yeah. ultimately in each continent in, uh, <laughs> you know help fund the touring and just all the sort of most starting again process especially in the US in probably 82 83 didn't it Oh, yes. And, and look, you know, the, the great thing about that from his and the band's perspective is that, that it meant that the investment that each of those three businesses made were not cross-collateralized, meaning that it wasn't recoupable all from one pool. Mm. It was recoupable from three different pools, meaning that, um, that they could, yeah, they could source the income and recoup the income um, from three different sources, which, you know, as a business, I mean, you know, it was very clever. Chris was very clever. And one thing- one thing, said, oh, one, thing just, sorry, on. one thing you said, sorry, one thing you just said early was about uh, you thought Chris might have been playing a little bit. Little bit. Was it you're thinking like uh, leveraging the release of the single with Don Walker uh, to get the meeting with Warners? Did you, is that what you were no, not nece- no, not necessary. I think he was just taking taking advantage of an, an opportunity to to engage. And looking at, as I say, you know, thinking about because at that time there were six major record companies, not three. So he was probably already doing his research and going now. Now, I'm not doing too well with Deluxe, and so they're with RCA, and they're pretty hopeless, so I don't want to be with them. So then there's Festival, there's CBS, there's WEA. This is what they were all called in the day. Mm. Um, Festival, well, they've got Mushroom, and I don't want to get near Mushroom. And, you know, so basically he was sort of narrowing it down and and, and probably looking at, at WEA, which became known as Warners, as, mm. as a good option because we were doing so well mm. with local product and also we were, you know, a market leader. So... And, you know, I have to say, you know, when when Chris, uh, from the minute that I met him, you know, the, the two of us got on very well and and uh, and we formed a pretty strong uh, working relationship. 
and you know that's that's why I guess um, why things work so well, uh, certainly from my perspective, you know, because I got very involved. <laughs> Fairly quickly. about the one thing did that lead you to an involvement with the one thing there well so they'd already rec- see mark opus was producing the new album yes. he was in the, he was in the studio with the band mm. when, when i was having this meeting about freedom and so within a short space of time you know they came in with the finished master of the one thing and we were already you know well down the line and getting this deal across the line so then it was like well then we're going to release this song and check out this video that we've just made um and you know and the album will be finished in in a month's time and then we'll schedule that to be released you know in three months time so yeah basically this was during the process of them making and finishing the the recording of the Shabu Shabar album. And so the one thing was our first song that we put out um, by an excess. Um, the, the freedom thing didn't do anything. Mm. You know, the film was a dud. The soundtrack went out. A couple of people wrote something nice about it because it was really good. But it never got airplay. It never, you know, nothing ever happened. Mm. <clears throat> but the one thing certainly happened. It was a big success. And it paved the way for the Shabu Shabar album to come out, and it was a huge success. And we put a lot of uh, effort into, you know, getting it um, well positioned in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, and it was the beginning beginning of a great relationship. And in the meantime, you know, Chris had taken a lot of that uh, the funds that he he picked up through the deals that he did with Atlantic and and Polygram in Europe and and Warner's in Australia <clears throat> to put the members of the band uh, on the road, not just to tour, but to go off and do little side trips and, uh, and just get more of a, more of a feeling of what the world was like. I think he seemed to learn a lot from sort of probably Cole Chisel's failure to grow internationally. It was quite a sort of a source of motivation for him, wasn't it? Yes. Look, you know, the interesting thing at the, at the time is that the only successful Australian band, uh, that, that had come out of Australia was ACDC. So nearly everybody else was was struggling, you know. There, uh, there, there was a sort of a wave that was happening that In Excess were riding at the time that it also included Midnight Oil and Men at Work uh, primarily, um, who all started to have some international success. <laughs> I think it was very shrewd. You know, Chris Chris really had a, a fantastic vision of how to uh, expand the band's horizons and uh, and give them more visibility in the international market. Design wise, did you have an involvement with anything to do with Shabu Shabar or the One Thing single or whatever there, or you, you were a bit of a conduit at the time, just with Chris I was and the a, label? I was a conduit. It was early stages. I was just getting to know him and and the band. They'd yeah. already done the photo sessions and the video shoot for the One Thing and yeah. the Shabu Shabar cover. Grant Matthews was the photographer who did the um, the session with Michael for the front cover, and yeah. uh, and and it was their idea. They cooked it up together and. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they basically came in with a bunch of photos and we just simply, you know, helped them lay it out and cut and paste the artwork and get it to the printers. <laughs> and I think interestingly, yeah, I think with uh, you mentioned Scott Hicks before, went on to direct, you know, international film Shine. He right. sort of directed three of the Shabu Shabar film clips. So there was obviously that link between Don Walker and, and Freedom and then with yeah. Access being, uh, I think they filmed in Adelaide where Scott's from, you know. That's right. One thing leads to another, you know. <laughs> um, it does. It does. Uh, yes. No. The the uh, the videos um, that were shot in Adelaide. So the band went down to Adelaide to shoot a couple of videos, but of course the weather wasn't really that good. So the intended shoot out in the desert um, for Don't Change turned into a uh, a shoot in a, <laughs> in, a in a hangar where yes. the, the planes were kept. 
Yes. Um, but it still worked. I mean, it was terrific stuff. And and um, the the creative process for Shabu Shabar was was a bunch of loose ends that were all sort of brought together just to because that video that was shot for the one thing was done well before all the other stuff, you know. So it was sort of one. Yeah. Step. Well, I think B, uh, B and I when we spoke to Mark Opitz, I think he was sort of commissioned with a three song sort of uh, template. I think there was the one thing uh, Johnson's airplane and and one other where. He was sort of, you know, I think commissioned to do, you know, a production on a song, and then yeah, they were trying him out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. probably. Even though, yeah. even though he had big runs on the board already, they were yeah. basically going, "Well, let's see what it's like." I yeah. mean, the other the other sliding door scenario here is that um, while Mark was still at Warner's prior to him leaving the, the role as the A&R manager, he signed Richard Clapton to uh, to Warner's, uh, Richard having been with yes. Festival Records for the first five or six albums of his career. Uh, and Richard came over to, to Warner's uh, and went straight into the studio with Mark producing and recorded an album called The Great Escape, which which essentially has a combination of the members of Cold Chisel and In Excess playing all the instruments. Yeah, uh, it's a great album, and yeah. uh, and I worked very closely with Richard on that. I did the the album cover for that, and the videos we commissioned, and the and the marketing and so forth. And I went to the studio a few times <clears throat> while the recordings. I remember meeting Gary and and John, the drummer. I started to get to know members of In Excess th- through these these connections. So, yeah, and, and Richard had just come off recording their uh, producing their second album, Underneath the Colors. So yeah. it's, all, it's all these sort of uh, synergies, I guess. Uh, yeah. That's right. To, to connect and things. Yeah. Did you want to ask something? No, no, I'm, I'm just fascinated <laughs> listener. And this is just also, I mean, I've read story to story and some of this is in story to story, but you're just bringing it like this three-dimensional thing to life now. It's just fantastic to hear it from somebody who was there and from the beginning. album and the cover and the artwork and the interiors there um just maybe for for background purposes how did that all evolve to that and uh and and sort of commence well uh one thing that you you're no doubt aware of is that this band uh toured relentlessly Uh, and chris you know uh and gary grant who was the the tour manager or or co-manager at the time i forget the exact sort of uh um, timing of all that, but uh, but basically that band was on the road all the time. You know, yes, they had a few breaks here and there, do a bit of recording, do a bit of songwriting. You know, jump on a plane and go to Europe for a two week writing trip. You know, I mean, it was relentless. Mm. They're, they're, I, I mean, actually saw a, a video, video the other day, an interview, and they did three hundred um, shows in one year. Three hundred. I think Kirk, I think Kirk still has his diaries. You know, with yeah. his document <laughs> every. And, uh, you know, actually, I, when I saw Kirk a few months ago, I said to him, you know, you should do something with those diaries because, you know, I mean, not publish them per se, but, you know, the statistics that, that are in those diaries would be yeah. astounding mm. for anybody, for an artist this day and age to look at that and go, you know, so that's what it takes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's the classic 10,000 hours scenario, you know, where the more mileage that you do, uh, the better you get. And, uh, and so... The point I'm making is that, you know, when the band were very rarely in town and very rarely, you know, uh, at home, you mm. know, they were always on the road. Mm. Um, so fitting things in to that was always a log- logistical nightmare, <laughs> um, which includes, you know, recording, uh, making videos and pulling together album and single covers. Um, it was always a challenge as to when and how these things could be done. So when the band were in the UK, uh, 
and I can't give you exact dates or anything like that, but they did a photo session with a very well-known Australian, uh, 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 British photographer, Mike Putland, um, who, you know, if you looked if you looked at any of the English press at the time, you know, he was one of the big rock, British rock photographers. So he did a session with the band or the band did a session with him and that session included a, a group photograph, which you can see on the front cover of the Swing album and then a whole lot of individual shots of, of each member of the band goofing around in front of the camera. Uh, so basically Chris... Uh, um, gave me this transparency, which was um, a, a large format transparency of of the band. Here's the group photo, and it sort of had this lovely treated sort of look about it, with sort of this blotchy sort of color color uh, look to it. Um, and then, and here's all these other photos, and it was proof sheets of the black and white photographs of each member of the band. He said, see if you can make something of this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, it, I didn't, it wasn't really, you know, um, that, that uh, complicated. It was basically, okay, I sort of got this transparency of the band, popped it on the light box, and then I started to imagine, you know, using that as the concept for, for then, you know, expanding it. So, yeah, then it was just a question of, you know, what objects that you put in there to sort of, um, um, you know, taking into account that, you know, the band had already been to Japan to do the videos for the one thing, uh, sorry, for Original Sin. And send um, a message, I think, as well. Yep. Yeah, And I sent a message. So there was this Japanese thing going on, you know, yeah. we just sort of already made. And so I thought, well, we should have some Japanese things in there, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think, and yeah. Been, yeah and I, I must, it, yeah. must admit, when we were looking at it, we are like, what is going on with this? But, like, now that I've spoken to you, I understand it's more like, like you say, it's like a it's like a journal of things that they'd been around into Japan and that was like a passport sort of thing going on. Yes, and I got and Kirk was to, you know Kirk and I would uh, um, talk about photography when we were together. So you know I said, well, give me some of your photographs so I can you know, include this. So then some of his slides, you know, um, transparencies, you know, I put on the and uh, but he didn't give me many. So I then I sort of searched through my collection and because of this whole idea of you know In Excess being an international band. I mean, this is one of so conceptually discussions that I had with Chris was like, you know, let's not brand us uh, in excess as an Australian band. Let's not, mm. you know, that's what Men at Work are doing because they've got Down Under out and they're an Aussie band and they have a, a, you know, a kangaroo flag pinned up behind the band when they're playing, you know, in in uh, on tour in America. You know, in excess are not going to be known as an Australian band. They're going to be known as an international band. Yeah. So, Which ultimately was a long-term break strategy. <laughs> Yes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I have to admit that in my own small way, I sort of was thinking along those lines when I was helping them put together their their visualization of their stuff. Is that you know, well, let's not let's not be be too parochial here. Let's try. Well, and yeah, I mean, it, it's such an interesting thing, and I think you know, part of our listener audience and the fact that the band went on to sort of global acclaim. That was such an important thing because what people can remember, and you probably do, Philip, very well is also between 83 and 86, Australia was like the the in thing culturally overseas with both the America's Cup win, we had Crocodile Dundee, we had Men at Work with their kitschy sort of Australian references, and we were starting to get a bit more of a global recognition, but it was on the back of a bit of a cultural cringe um, yep. that, you know, it, in hindsight, probably hasn't aged well. <laughs> so you're absolutely right, and yeah. and that's exactly why you know Chris was was right to to sort of make that point. It's like let's let's not advertise that. I mean, not not hide it, but no. but, you know, but don't wear it on your sleeve, kind of thing. It's yeah. not. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And and one of the things which just just to sideline a little bit is that as a kid, you know, getting that album and the album cover, or whatever, there it was quite fascinating. And I said on the last podcast, maybe two podcasts ago, that lyrics uh, weren't a big thing in the sort of seventies, um, eighties to put on an album. I mean, as an art uh, creator, the swing album when you open up inside, we spoke about this last week. We thought the photo and, and look, hands up. We thought the photos of the band had aged badly <laughs> on the front <laughs> with, with, with their portraits, but it was. But we we loved the interior and just the fascination. I think it was the most fascinating interior and just album to, to discover. And 
in the late 80s, early 90s, when lyrics became a thing on inside album sleeves, it took maybe some creativity away from maybe the artists like yourself, you know? Mm-hmm. Look, you know, it was it was a great situation to be in, in, in that we'd had so much success with uh, with Shabush Bar. We were listening to the songs that that had been uh, recorded for uh, for the Swing album, and we'd also I think we'd already put out Original Sin as the first single, and it was it was huge. Mm. And in fact, it was the first song that band had success with internationally. Uh, mm. It went to number one in France, mm. right. uh, and then that sort of helped to to buoy the Polygram people in Europe to go, okay, we've mm. got something serious here. So it meant that we could indulge. In, in in spending a bit more money on on the album cover and the single covers, which is exactly what Chris wanted, um, because it, it incentivizes people to buy records if they look and feel yeah. like now, it's, it's this, this, is an, this is an album that let's just for for credit to Philip here. This album took in excess from a an emerging band in Australia, really to the the you know the top of the tree with Midnight Oil. They had uh, I think ten to one out the same year. Uh, maybe a year earlier, but we're talking 300,000 plus sales in the oh, 80s. It was huge. Uh, they climbed just at, from sort of emerging band to something massive. How, how, how did it change your life at the time? It was amazing um, uh, in that, you know, uh, I mean, you know, working in a record company, you're just, uh, you're just, you know, uh, I mean, with, to a lot of artists, you know, you're dismissed as just being somebody that works for a record company. Um mm. But to be the creative person in a record company and actually have your work, you know, on display. <laughs> um, Everywhere. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's good for the ego. I have to say it at the same time, you know, it, my life was, uh, it was such an intense period of time for me. My wife How old I, were you, if you don't mind me asking then, Philip? Yeah. When it came out. Yeah, I was younger. 84. We'll go 84 here. Yeah. <laughs> no, 80, uh, not in 84, that is. <laughs> yeah, I was 28. Wow. And, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so I had started at Warner's when I was 19, yeah. and um, and by this stage, yeah, uh, my wife and I had our first child in 84, wow. um, and we had two more boys in the next couple of years, so we had three children under three. Uh, it was it was intense, and, and at the same time, <laughs> not that I could tell anyone at the time, but I got phone calls from people like Michael Gadinsky asking me to do record covers for their artists. Oh, um, so I, poached. <laughs> yeah, which I did. I did I did a, a number of, um, and, and yeah, and I love doing it, you know. Name a couple quickly that you did, yeah, you know, under ones? the Gadinsky stable, yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the best one, the, the most well-known one is the models out of, out of mind, out of sight. Right. Or out of yeah. sight, out of mind. I always get it wrong. Um, <laughs> I did that one. I did one for a band called Diddy Smash, which was Dave yep. Belkin's band um, yep. called The Optimist. Now, B, that's the song Slice of Heaven from Foot Rock Flats. That was Dave Dobbin, uh, oh, Diddy, oh. Diddy Smash. Yeah. So if you know that song, that was a New Zealand band that probably struggled to make it here, but they were very big in New Zealand, weren't they, Philip? Yes, unfortunately, Diddy Smash never really. I mean, you know, when Gadinsky called me, he said, you know, we, we've been struggling with this band for, for years and we just haven't got. Yeah, but but I think this album that they're making now is really good, and I really want a good, good cover. Can you do it for me? Um, mm. uh, and and unfortunately, that album didn't didn't do what Gadinsky hoped it would, and so he dropped the band. Mm. And then Dave Dobbin then got commissioned to do the soundtrack to the cartoon Foot Rock Flats, which is where mm. Slice of Heaven came from. Mm. So Dave's success sort of came later, but mm. uh, nevertheless, an amazing talent. He's a He's, you know, he's one of New Zealand's best. Yes. Um, but, yes, yeah, so so at the time, you know, yes, I was I was getting asked by people that were, I was associated with within the sort of Warner world and also outside to sort of help out with things. And, yes. frankly, that's, that's why I got into the business, you know. I was somebody that was passionate about music but loved doing record covers. The art, yeah. yeah. If we move to Listen Like Thieves, now this is an album that obviously probably broke, you know, in excess in America in terms of a top five single with What You Need. Um, the cover itself, um, tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind that and how that came together. All right. Well, I, I'm going to preface that by saying that uh, uh, another amazing thing happened with the band during The Swing. I mean, the, the, the Swing album, uh, apart from Original Sin, was produced by Nick Lorne, who also produced you know, Midnight Oil's 10 to 1 yes, and, yes. and also produced some of uh, the models. Models, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, he was a fantastic British producer who was was out here doing a lot of great work. Um, but also uh, 
Michael Hutchins uh, and Richard Lowenstein became friends and Richard then swung into into doing music videos for In Excess. Pretty sure the first one was Burn For You, um, where he jumped on a plane and went up to where the band was touring at the time because yes. you know, yes. they were always on the road yes. uh, and filmed... Uh, magazine Room Through the Jungle. <laughs> yeah. Through mangrove swamps. Up yeah. up at, uh, um, but... And Richard's partner at the time was Lynn Marie Milburn, who was a, a fantastic uh, animator. Uh, so every video that, that that Richard made at the time, uh, Lynn Marie was was very much a part of that. Um, doesn't get credited enough, you know. If you look at the video for what you need, you know that that that's a whole lot of still images shot in the mm. studio with the band, mm. and then hand drawn every frame by mm. Lynn. Um, and and with Burn for You, the same thing. You know, there were there were lovely little animated bits that, that were thrown in there. So for, I was back at back at uh, at home base at Warner's. You know, getting these videos and getting images and so forth. And so I was reacting to the work that Richard and Lynn did. So the single covers for the for the singles off the swing, I would take the images that were that were in the video and then try and incorporate them into the to the overall concept of the of the album cover so i don't have a, a show and tell here but but basically you know if you look at the cover for burn for you for instance it's got it, it's got the fish from the yes <laughs> yes i mean it's but then it's got a sort of a, a crayon drawing that i did of an image of kirk playing the guitar from the burn for you video i mean yeah, you know, the, it's the like, yeah yeah so yeah. It, it's all about you know, and this is pre-digital, so it's all about mixed media, but in a very sort of organic kind of way. It created a yeah. narrative like theme going through, didn't they? Those singles yeah. into the album and that. Yeah. Well, and you know, each time you would put a new song out from an album, or when you put a new album out, you know, as a record company, you would pr- print up um, point of sale material that will go up in record shops around the country. And uh, and in, and in my case, I was producing material that would then be sent off to Atlantic in America for them to to use and then off to Polygram in Europe for them to use and and Warner's in Japan who, who, who did their own thing as well. So everything that I started with, whether it be a single cover or an album cover, that we would then package everything up, you know, like the parts and then we post them off to, to the record companies and then they would receive them and then do their own interpretations of them, sometimes exactly the way we, we did them here or they would... So, for instance, the swing was released in in Europe as a single cover, not a double cover. Oh. Right. So, Polygram thought, well, they're not big enough yet to have a gatefold sleeve, so we'll just we'll forget all this shit inside, and we'll just have. <laughs> um, Which is probably the reason why I didn't get to see it until I was here, actually. Because hmm. I would have also, had the European one, yeah. Well, yeah, but also uh, it's interesting. I'm sure you've touched on this um, in your podcast. You know, in excess didn't break in the UK till after nearly every other territory in the world. Yes. I mean, people knew yes. who they were, but yeah. they didn't have the success uh, that they were having in other markets uh, there yeah. until until much later, until after ki- or t- till kick out. Classic cover, isn't like these. It's beautiful. Well, it, it was it was it was Plan B. You know, Plan A was was that uh, the because they they you know they said we want you to design the, the album. Thank you very much. And so come to us with your ideas. We're pl- we're planning on calling it Listen Like Thieves. Um, I came up with an idea, and I actually did. Uh, drawings, and I actually did a, a recce, a, f- a photo shoot recce uh, to a location where I wanted to shoot it, uh, which was located in the um, in the the, the so called uh, high mountain country of of, uh, of Australia down near Perisher. Um, so I planned to shoot the band in this sort of wilderness um, uh, to to create the photos that would that would be the cover of, of Listen Like Thieves. And as I say, I did drawings and I presented it to the to, to Chris and the band and they all thought it was a good idea. And then I went down with my photographer friend, Paul Clark, to, to do a, a photo recce down there. Um, but anyway, as it turned out, the weather turned 
uh, and and the band had a, a small window to to uh, back in Australia before they went on tour again. Um, so we just couldn't do the photo shoot. It was just too hard. Yeah. So plan B was I went on the road with them for about a week down in uh, Victoria. They played a few regional com- uh, cities, Ballarat and um, Shepparton, and I forget the other cities. And I was literally on the road with them for, for about a week. And I took a whole lot of photographs of them, ma- mainly live images. Um, and they were in a, a, a twin engine plane going from town to town, and, uh, and I was in a hire car driving. So the photograph on the back is a photo that I took while I was driving between Ballarat and Shepparton, <laughs> the sun wow. setting. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's beautiful purple sort of skyline shots, you know. Yeah. And then the front cover image is, is quite obviously Michael, you know, on stage with his... Um, uh, watch so the, the World the, argue the, T-shirt on this Yeah, the Watch the World argue T-shirt, which, which uh, somebody had made for him and he wore you know, every day for, for like a year until it, <laughs> until it fell it, off. <laughs> yeah. um, but the idea, and this is all pre-digital again, uh, was to sort of try and create something that was that, that was not, a, it wasn't intended for it to look like a live thing. It was intended to sort of be kind of abstract and to just use the the stencil of In Excess as the sort of you know, the, um, the front cover. Mm-hmm. some kind of image showing through it. And I wanted the image to be sort of iridescent, you know, to sort of have a, uh, a glowing sort of quality mm-hmm. to it. So what I ended up doing was putting the the image of the, the back cover, the, the purple sunset, uh, and then combining that with the live image of Michael with the spotlight behind him to create so that they, they I mean, it doesn't really look Not like dead. it, but that's... That's how it sort of gave it, and I and I went to this this place um, that did all the scanning, and I got them to scan the two and sort of position the two. I mean, it took took ridiculous amount of this to think of how quickly you can cut and paste things and do things in Photoshop oh, now compared to what we were doing. And then you'll notice that on the swing and on the Listen Like Thieves album, all of the typography is done by hand. So that's. I, I bought these Japanese calligraphy brushes. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> well, um, it's interesting you say that because I'm looking at the right hand corner just at the moment. And when we were doing the album covers the other week, it felt like this sort of Japanese type extension of such to the naked mm-hmm. eye. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. So, so it was a Japanese calligraphy brush, not not one that you dip in, in ink, but it's you just squeeze the, 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 um, the pen yeah. and, the, and the ink flows into the into the, the nib and you just, you can sort of do all this. So for the swing, I sort of did it sort of like like that. And then for Listen Like Thieves, I sort of did it sort of in a, in a much more stylistic kind of way. So that the title and the band's, yeah, the title down the bottom is is that that listen like these written with the calligraphy brush. Then we put an image of Michael into the type, a blurry image, you know? So once, or maybe it wasn't Michael, maybe it was somebody else in the band, but, you know, I sort of basically just took a whole lot of close-ups of blurry images of them live to sort of try and get all these abstract images. Quick, quick two part for you. Um, uh, Chris Thomas, who sort of coveted the band, I think, globally and was very keen to record with them, felt that the band had never quite um, produced a sound on their albums that, that took into account their excellence sort of in a live setting. And as you said earlier, you didn't deliberately set out to do that, but I always felt the cover with Michael, there almost looks like he's on stage in that silhouette version and it has that live feel to it. Second part to that is the name in excess must be a designer's sort of logo dream to try and come up with some interesting concepts art wise. Cause it's not, you know, it's not super casual fragilistic XBL attention. <laughs> <inside. laughs> um, did, yeah. did, am it's I correct in that it's assertion? It's graphically nice to look not? at, isn't it? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, it gives you scope because it's mm. broken and it's sort of an, almost an acronym in a way, but it's a play on letters, but. Oh, well, look, I'll tell you a little aside on, on the name. So when we, when we did Shabu Shaba uh, and, uh, Atlantic Records um, were putting it out in the States, they insisted on putting a sticker on the album cover that said pronounced in excess. It's <laughs> I-N-E-X-S-S. Um, because they thought that people were too stupid to look at, you know, I-N-X-S and, and realise that it was actually in excess. I'm probably right. <laughs> um, and 
And look, you know, interestingly, uh, I, something I've neglected to, to mention uh, regarding that, and that is that, you know, the Shabu Shabar album did very well in Australia. It didn't really do very much elsewhere. I mean, it made a, a bit of a, uh, a noise um, wherever the band went to, to do touring because, you know, they picked up fans and, and, and fans picked up the album, but they didn't really have that much success. So there was a lot of pressure on Chris to market the band uh, with their looks. So that's why he got the photo done, uh, the Mike Putland photograph, and that's why he handed it to me and said, we have to put this on the cover because I'm getting pressure from the American label and from the Europeans, I think, as well, to have have the band on the cover, right? Mm. Mm. So if you recall when you were going through your analysis of all the album covers, the first album cover and the second album cover were paintings. Yes. Um, yes. It's picked, picked by Michael uh, by, by Chris Murphy. Mm. Um, he, he really did have quite a, a strong uh, handle on, on, on things like this, you know, the direction of things. And, in fact, you know, most of what I did with in excess was through Chris. Chris was the was the guiding, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, he was a manager in, in more ways than one. Um, and then so then you get to listen like thieves and, uh, you know, he said, don't worry about putting the band on the front, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be fine. Just, you know, keep going with what you've got in mind. I actually had images that I had taken of the band live across the bottom of the back cover, you know, that, that sunset shot mm. in the dark bottom half, I had sort of ghostly images of, of each member of the band. Um, I remember going out to the airport to meet with the band when they were in transit from one city to another <laughs> to have a meeting with them in the Qantas, you know, lounge. And and I'm pretty sure it was uh, Andrew who said, oh, I'm sick of seeing pictures of me behind keyboards and, you know, this, this I don't like the vibe about, you know, so... So we basically scrapped those images that I had there and then we found the, the black and white photograph or the CPU photograph that we put in on the back. Yeah. Um, and so it was a way of sort of balancing that, that uh, pressure from the US company in particular to have the band on the cover, mm -hmm. um, but also try and have it sort of artistically suiting the way we wanted to convey the, the record. And interestingly, um, if you look at what happened next, the friendship that, uh, that Michael formed with Nick Egan, uh, Nick Egan being the kind of commercial artist that he is and, and the pressure continuing to come down hard from uh, from the international labels, certainly not from Australia, to have the band on the cover, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, Kick was the perfect convergence of, the, of those yeah. requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Very clever album. Yeah, because, because nowadays, you, you know, you'd think for almost six albums, albeit The Swing being only one we're on the cover, no, no, no label would, would tolerate, you know, uh, not doing that these days. I guess there was a, an artistic expression that was allowed in these days back when you were doing this. Oh, look, you know, it all came down to how, um, how successful the, the band or the artist was mm. as to how much they could di dictate as to what their art was going to look like. <clears throat> and, and look, you, you know, it was interesting, you know, when I first started at Warner's in the art department and uh, and the art director that I was working for, you know, would have the headache constantly of having to try and convert um, these extraordinary record covers that were coming in from overseas uh, to get manufactured and put out in, in Australia without compromising uh, what had been dictated to us. So uh, as an example, um, Atlantic Records had Led Zeppelin and Led Zeppelin uh, for their first couple of albums, they were they were pretty standard sort of record covers. But you know, because they became one of the biggest bands that that Atlantic had, their manager Peter Grant insisted that uh, that they have the album covers that that he and the band wanted, uh, and they commissioned a company called a British company called Hip hypnosis to do those covers. So if you know the, the albums that I'm talking about, Led Zeppelin Three, which has a spinning mm. spinning wheel inside it costs yep. lots of money. And then album four is there's absolutely no mention of the band's name or the, the album's title. And that's anywhere. their biggest seller, I think, isn't it? Led Zeppelin yeah. four, I think. And then let's and then yeah. the following one, Physical Graffiti, you know, had yeah. all these cutouts and yep. <clears throat> you know, Atlantic Records was the was the label that Rolling the Rolling Stones went to with their Sticky Fingers album, yeah. which had the Andy Warhol zip on the front, you know? Mm. I mean, yeah. these were ridiculously uh indulgent and expensive record covers, <laughs> but they were 
uh, by artists that could could dictate, you know, that that's what they wanted and the record company has to spend that kind of money. There were probably deals done behind the scenes like, well, the packaging deduction on this is going to be that much higher or whatever. And I'm pretty sure we probably did the same <clears throat> within excess. I can't really recall. But, you know, Chris quite wise, wisely wanted the in excess albums and singles to be deluxe, you know, to be um, the, of the of the highest grade. So, therefore, we we indulged, you know. I mean, if you've seen some of the single covers that we did for these two albums in particular, <clears throat> you know, there was the, the single cover we did for Kiss the Dirt um, was, a, was a multi, I think it was a th- uh, six-panel fold-out. <laughs> mm. um, and and the beauty of that is that you know when you put that into the stores the week of release, the fans will rush out and buy it because it was limited edition. You know if you didn't buy it the first week of release, then you might never be able to get it at all. Mm. And so therefore, you would guarantee a high chart position because the sales were so good in the first week. So it's, it's marketing. You know? Yeah. 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 This is Sheila from Birmingham, Alabama. Hey, this is Susan from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi, this is Maiti from Montreal, Canada. This is Suzanne from Los Angeles, California. And that's a wrap. Well, that's a wrap, B. Uh, what a lot of fun was talking to Philip today. And uh, I know we're going to be there, possibly extra footage of this. <laughs> we mm. might have to move, move some into next week. But uh, he was fascinating today, wasn't he? So fascinating, Dick. I could listen to him all day. What a yeah. gentleman. What a yeah. gentleman. Yeah, and still really working. Are, really art, articulate, you know, succinct, mm. measured, you know, informative. I mean, just a dream guest. And just by the way, Philip, we have a uh, two, uh, two, three episode appearance thing where you be, might become an honorary patron. So uh, <laughs> so uh, we will keep that out there for you. But, um, yes, thank you. He was a true gentleman today. All right. Well, getting into fan engagement, B, we've had quite a big week of uh, fan engagement from every everybody from some new patrons through to some of the various platforms. I think I even might have responded out to a gentleman standing in Malaysia this week who oh, yeah. was part of a podcast series. Uh, you know more about who runs what and things. So is he from a podcast, that guy? So not a podcast, from a platform, maybe from a oh. Facebook page group in Malaysia. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I got them mixed up, actually. I thought that was Jason's page. There's so many. In fact, Hayden, I would like to give a big shout out to a couple of Facebook pages that help us with um, getting this message out of the mission that we've got in getting in excess into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So there's um, I've, I've done the top 10 list and some of their um, admin. So there's a really cute page called the Hutches. Have you ever seen them, Hayden? I have, yes. Yeah, yes. they've been around. And that's by a lady called Kelly. So thank you, Kelly, for allowing us to um, help you get the message out. Um, there's the Michael Hutchins Fan Club. We don't know who that's by, unfortunately. And then there's the Michael Hutchins In Excess Calling All Nations by Claudia. Um, the Michael Hutchins With Love, that's a collective of admins. Then we've got Faris Hutchins Pengilly and Beers by Renee. We've yep. got In Excess fans, um, Hutch Nation, that's me and my lovely crew with Joe Robbins and Carrie Ann and Priscilla and Nadine. Then we've got the In Excess Club, In Excess Club by Michael. We've got In Excess fans worldwide by Jason Hughes. Um, Michael Hutchins and his legacy, that's by Jimmy Guest. We've got in Excess and Michael Hutchins, that's by the Argentinian gang. Hi, guys. I know you love those, don't you, Hayden? Mm. Um, then we've got Australian In Excess stroke Michael Hutchins, that's Nancy and Janet. And then the big one, which is Michael Hutchins of In Excess, you are and still are a rock god. Of course <laughs> he is. And that is a massive group. They've got something like... 12,000 um, followers, and that was by my mate, Matt Brown. Now, Matt um, doesn't do the page so much now, but he's quite active. So mm. well done, Matt, for getting that page together. It rocks. Well, my little friend was uh, who uh, mentioned about Malaysia earlier was Masril Hisham, and mm. Masril standing below the sort of, uh, well, I guess, those twin towers in Kuala Lumpur, and he's part of the In Excess Alive public group or fan page group. Have you heard of them, In Excess Alive? Mm. Oh, yes, I have. Yeah. yeah I think of 1,200 members. And yeah, he was just, I think, posting within that group. So, um, yeah, so kudos to him and, and just everybody who's sort of been communicating with him. Um, 
I know, uh, you know, part of part of the fun of being in communities like this is the the chance to sort of, as I said, chat to people with a lot like, like uh, minded interest, and uh, you know, obviously experiences with the band and concerts and songs, and mm. uh, and everyone seems to have access to different footage. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm posting stuff, you know, onto our patron page that I've found from others, but you know, it's it's all open to sharing because mm. you know it's all about you know. Uh, you know, pushing the band forward and 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 entertaining because there's some great little posts and things. There was one the other week that I'd I'd forgotten completely about. It was that Welcome to Wherever You Are 15 minute sort of little promo tape uh, or promo video of the band uh, at the concert for life and just the lead up to that. And yeah. I hadn't seen that for 20 years. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, so, some good stuff out there, isn't there? Some really good stuff. I want to speak about. Dodge 69 from last week. Do you okay. remember? Do you remember when we were talking about that? And I said, listen to this guy. So he calls himself the ace and he is pretty cool. And ace uh, thanks. anyway, I think I like him. <laughs> he likes Jack, us. Does your husband James know about that? That was rather talk. sultry, I think. Um, no, but you know you sounded like that. Oh. It was like it was like mm. Dick Emery. You were like Dick Emery. Yeah, do you remember I'm naughty? But I think <laughs> I like you. Do you remember, remember show? You are naughty, but I like, I like you. you. Yeah, oh, that's about that. right, actually. That's it. that's probably my uh, my line. <laughs> the Americans won't know what we're talking about. Here. Hello, a famous British show in the seventies. Anyway, keep you going. Remember him? He used to dress up as a woman, didn't he? He did. He did. Uh, a lot of old men used to dress up as women and get a show out of it. What was that all about? Let's straighten up, okay? We're all right, okay, okay. I'm talking we, we had, we've had Glenn, who's made a bit of a, 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 oh a, my a God. tsunami uh, entry into our podcast group and our what? patron group. He is just like on every level of awesomeness. <laughs> he has lived the band via <laughs> Paul Jolie, um, yeah. drumming out um, Don't Change, and he was like, oh, <gasps> Transfix, this is it, and it's his <laughs> band. And now, yeah, he's spilling onto our um, patron pages all the lovely photographs he's had taken with the band. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of quick things, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, the newsletter, how do people get that, B? Because I see people on through our uh, emails seemingly subscribing. What's the process of being able to get that sent out to you weekly? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? It's really, really doing well, the newsletter. The best way to subscribe to the newsletter is through our website. So our website is inaccessaccessportareas.com and just go to the newsletter page and there you are. You, there's a link there that will take you straight through. You just fill out the form and then we'll just pop it into your email once a week. Now, I do believe some people might be missing it because it does sometimes go to your spam folder. So you might need to adjust your settings for that if you want that to come through. But yep. yeah, a weekly newsletter and it's jam packed with some good facts and yeah, it'll stuff, take you back in it? time. This time, this time, thirty years ago, forty years ago, twenty years mm. ago, that in excess. We'll talk a bit about the upcoming podcast episode. Yeah, you no know, competitions, auctions, merchandise, patron information. Um, yeah, and a uh, snapshot. Fan, fan, Fan mm. of the week or patron yeah. of the week. I mean, it's it's a great little little read. So kudos to the girls there. Mm -hmm. uh, also, to B, I'm being very researched this week. I believe t-shirts are on their way. Is that right? Oh my goodness! <laughs> I thought this was going to be a quick process, but it isn't. So, um, literally, in a, in a nutshell, I've just had an email just, and she said they might be re ready today to be picked up. Right. Woo so what then, are the t-shirts? Are they? So uh, thank you, everyone who's bought them and have been waiting for them. I know that you're eager to get them. They will be on the way by the end of this. Now week. these t-shirts with you and the big glasses on that big rock chick photo shoot, aren't they? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Are these avatars of us? There's avatars of us. It's our right. logo, darling. Right. Okay. All right. I've also not just done the logo. I've actually done um, what it's like the waveform as well. That's yeah. pretty cool as, as well. So it's like a play button. <laughs> so I've called them play play siglets. And what we sell them for, B? Um, I think the t-shirts are around about forty dollars, and right. the caps are twenty eight, and the singlets yeah. are thirty five. Right. And about 10, 15 percent of that goes towards our profit for the podcast or, you know, the revenue for the podcast. I guess there's a cost in putting all this together. Oh, gosh, um, yes. But a little bit of the profit we make goes into the podcast. So uh, we do appreciate anything you do in that regard. I know with our auction, we've had some fantastic, you know, fan packs and prize packs and by my side mm. uh, releases and things. Just an update on the auction, B. 
Update on the auction is we have got the crew t-shirt still going at the moment. So that's doing really well in the first three days. It went all the way up. I'm knocking on someone's door to get another box from another member of the band. (laughs) So hopefully we'll have some real nice um, crisp new stuff come in our way soon as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of such, we are aiming to get another band member on over the next two, three weeks. Two band so. members. Well, we, I'm just I'm low balling here at the moment, B. All right, right, okay. We, I, you know, well, I've you, just you, thrown it in too. <laughs> you talk blue sky. I talk sort of clouds and some overcast cumulus nimbus. I oh, know okay? you do. So, so <laughs> we are aiming to get a band member on soon. Well, two is a positive, but uh, that would be exciting. So we will know more once we get confirmation. We have an upcoming episode with the Welcome to Wherever You Are album review in the next two, three weeks as well. Mm-hmm. So that is definitely coming. Mm-hmm. I just realised, B, in the last 12 months, we've only re- reviewed two albums. Really? <laughs> it's it X and Live Baby Live, I think. So we wow. sort of got through the, the first uh, few rather quickly. But um, we well, have. Well, a- <laughs> I'm liking the pace, mate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's sort of something that's going to be coming up as well. But uh, we thought, in light of Philip being on today, B, we. Uh, he had such, uh, well, there's a couple of uh, anecdotes that I do know that uh, are particularly pertinent to him. Now, some of maybe have, have come through sort of the episode today and some may come through next week as well. But uh, uh, we do know that he had quite an intrinsic sort of role in the early days of having Chris Murphy meet, I guess, Warners and, you know, Don Walker and all those different sort of people in terms of sort of proximity to one another and Cole Chisel. So we thought we would go out today with a couple of songs, one being the uh, rather uniquely uh, less well-known song called Speed Kills where Michael does the vocals and it's sort of a cold chisel, Don Walker written song for the movie Freedom. It's got a great little hook and a, and a chorus, just hang in there. It does sort of pay you back in uh, dividends if you give it two or three listens. Uh, and the second one, which uh, is very, very intrinsic to sort of I think that that outdoor-y feeling vibe Australian of what Listen Like Thieves was in terms of a lot of the artwork and things and the film clips. It was Kiss the Dirt, which was a, a particularly poignant one for Philip and a fan favourite and a song that uh, goes under the radar sometimes, but I know has a lot of interest out there. I think one of our patrons last week on the call, Zoom call, had Loves Kiss the Dirt. So it's almost an ode to her as well. But we will go out with a double shot of uh, Speed Kills and Kiss the Dirt mm-hmm. as we say goodbye. It's a goodbye from me. And it's a goodbye from B. Goodbye, everybody. When I'm confused, don't know right from wrong. Get in the shaker and drive it all night long. Weekend comes, you see us fly down Tarrant's Road, and when I'm dry, I, I go down. Lux Hotel Elaine is the DJ tonight So run along and get right
love.